I'm Mark. Uh, as mentioned, I'm here on behalf of ICON talking about uh, how we make blockchain work for the API economy. But I am not going to start with us. I'm going to start with, I think, the most interesting case study of what's being done with our technology today. Uh, and it's in deep space, uh, as I know some of you have uh, read the program, this is what you've shown up for. Uh, the astronomers we work with uh, are using deep learning to find objects in deep space. Uh, I am quite jealous of the slides they get in their presentations, so I've made generous use of all these sexy deep space images. Uh, they have this great data, but one of the things they're actually missing are tools to take advantages of the images they get. Right now they get data back about uh, you know, the light, the energy, all the stuff that's coming back, as well as the images, and they don't use the actual pixel level data. Uh, and some astronomers that we're working with have decided to try to use transfer learning, uh, basically computer vision technology, to try and solve this problem and take advantage of all these really juicy, sexy images they get back from space telescopes and observatories and things like this. Uh, for those of you who don't know what transfer learning is, it's basically a technique where you can use an AI that's been trained on a certain topic and use it to analyze other uh, images in this case. So you use uh, a, a data set like ImageNet, which is a very uh, commonly used huge data set of terrestrial images, uh, and use it to analyze the extraterrestrial images uh, using the same data set. Uh, and it's interesting because, you know, as, as we've been talking about today, the data that goes in is so important to the quality of the AI you get. Uh, but this is a way to use very uh, broad and commonly used data sets to do new types of tasks in computer vision. Uh, this is done um, with a technique uh, called T-SNE, which is T-Distributed Stochastic Neighbor Embedding, which we'll get into in one quick second. But basically what it does is take this huge multi-dimensional output you get back from uh, the deep learning system of all the different objects uh, as dimensions, uh, what they call feature vectors when you're doing deep learning, uh, and use uh, the probability distribution of those feature vectors to analyze uh, objects that have no relation to the uh, training of the AI. So in this case, we're looking at uh, objects that are part of this, uh, you know, this cloud here, and we see that the AI has identified that there is a 10% chance this might be velvet, it might be a binder, it might be genes, it might be a stingray. Uh, of course, it's none of these objects. This AI has only been tra trained on objects here on Earth. Uh, but using this reduction, the t -SNE, uh, reduced data set, we take this like multi-dimensional data feed and are able to find objects that are similar to each other. And I know uh, we're not all AI experts in this room, so basically what this does is allow us to find similar objects in space. So in the case where they maybe want to find the edge of a galaxy or a supernova or whatever it is that a researcher is looking for, they can use the AI to search through massive, massive amounts of data and find similar things without having to first specially train an AI to do it, which is, of course, a big and difficult task. So yeah, we take this like huge, you know, n-dimensional uh, data stream and reduce it down to a two-dimensional plot, find things that are near each other, and we can identify objects uh, despite the lack of, uh, you know, we, we're finding these similar structures and images which is useful for these researchers. But of course, this transfer learning technique can be used across a huge variety of fields. Um, and so, you know, you can find these similar objects. The data sets, of course, are massive when you're talking about astronomy, hundreds of terabytes of data. And so the problem is actually managing the studies, the research, and the cost of these things. And this is where we start to come in and where blockchain actually gets involved. Blockchain enables uh, decentralized networks of computers through a partner of ours called Hadron 
to share the load of this processing, this mass scale AI processing, and actually do it vastly more uh, inexpensively and faster than you'd be able to do with a typical centralized setup. So it's cheaper, it's faster, and this is what kind of Hadron brings to the table in this study. Uh, this uh, technique is, of course, one of many AI tasks they do. Their specialization is just this distributed AI compute on blockchain and using basically the work of AI computation as like a proof of work model. So it's really cutting edge uh, AI on blockchain work. And they're able to do techniques that are kind of similar to what you might remember if you're as old as I am about using SETI at home when you're in college, which is basically taking these huge data sets, splitting it up across many, many computers, many, many servers, and doing all this work in parallel to get to a very complex answer with a very huge, huge data set. Uh, I think this is amazing that this is happening now and is really only possible at a fraction of the cost it was possible before due to blockchain and decentralization. Uh, so where do we fit in? Uh, at ICON, we are powering these kinds of uh, businesses and uh, to work together. Uh, we have an API monetization protocol and an API marketplace that actually makes it easy uh, to use traditional kind of APIs we'd all be used to uh, in the technology world to interact across uh, the world of blockchain and the kind of centralized internet. Um, there's a lot of complexity there, but there's also a lot of opportunity. Uh, for those of you in the room who don't know what an API is, it's basically how computers talk to each other. So everyone who has a smartphone in your pocket is probably connected to 20 APIs right now. Uh, that's everything from uh, the Facebook API to get the messages from Messenger, the Google API to get your uh, emails, maybe the Maps API to get directions, uh, and you know financial APIs to make payments to your bank, to get your balance. Everything that's done on the internet right now is done with APIs. Uh, this has generated this huge, huge industry. Uh, you probably see our friends here uh, from IBM talking about the API economy, $2.2 trillion predicted this year. So it's a huge market in both free and paid APIs. Uh, and there is a real need to translate this fundamental part of the internet into this new world of the blockchain. And that's what we do. And so we help bridge the gap between these fully decentralized businesses like Hadron that do business in cryptocurrency, that use public key, private key encryption, that use decentralized nodes as servers, and bridge that gap with uh, these folks from the very traditional world of you know, scientific researchers at a university who have a regulatory reasons they can't do business in cryptocurrency, have no desire to do business in cryptocurrency, it's completely outside their field of study, and they want to use typical login and password, right? They want to pay for things in dollars or pounds. Uh, and so you need someone in the middle to kind of translate this world of APIs onto and, and map that into this world of blockchain. And so that's what we do is kind of form that bridge between these two worlds uh, and connect this API economy uh, and this newly growing blockchain economy. Uh, today, the total kind of market cap of all cryptocurrencies is about the size of the economy of a country like Ireland or Denmark. But it's expected to grow 10x by many observers over the next few years, which would actually make the nation of cryptocurrencies the, tenth, uh, the fifth largest economy in the world. Right? And so that's what we're expecting, and we want to help uh, make that possible and deliver actual value from all these decentralized tools, all these new platforms, all these new networks to work with the traditional businesses that I'm sure most of the people in this room work at today, uh, most of the people at this conference work at today, right? And I think it's incredibly important that we give tools like this that allow people from you know, the normal world of the internet to interact with this new blockchain world, or else we'll never realize all the value that these 
startups are, are bringing to the table. And that's everything from the technical interoperability in terms of the login, the security, the access control, but also the payment, the economic interoperability. Because each blockchain startup, by and large, has their own currency. And we know the businesses of tomorrow aren't going to want to hold 17 different wallets with 35 different cryptocurrencies just to operate their business, right? No one wants that. Uh, and so what we're doing uh, is what we call uh, the transformation of APIs into D-services. D-services are our term for web services that work on the blockchain uh, using a protocol we call the Open Rights Exchange. It's access rights for APIs. Uh, and that, this is basically just an API that's usable by blockchain apps. Uh, this is a, a two-way street. It means that blockchain startups can sell to real businesses, but it also means that traditional businesses can sell to this new class of citizen on the internet, which are dApps, distributed apps and DAOs, right? These democratically autonomous organizations. Uh, these dApps and DAOs, uh, they're not corporations, they're not people, and so they can't have a credit card, they can't have a traditional bank account, right? All they can have is this cryptocurrency wallet. And so it's critical that if we're gonna give real users a good user experience from using an, uh, you know, a DAP or a DAO, all these great new decentralized technologies, they're gonna need to plug into things like SendGrid to send emails to their customers or MailChimp, right? They're gonna need to plug into things like Mixpanel or Google Analytics to get good data about what their customers are really doing, right? They're gonna plug into Twilio to send uh, you know, two-factor authentication via text message. All this basic fundamental building blocks of the internet as we know it that give us as consumers really high quality products that we like using need a way to bridge into this new world of dApps and smart contracts uh, on, on the blockchain. And so, you know, that's what we do. That's what we do in the case of Hubble and Hadron, and it's what we're trying to bring together here. Uh, I, I think I've been through this, so I won't uh, you know, go through it too much more, but you know, we also provide a stable currency, which is a, a digital uh, currency, a cryptocurrency, we call CPU, but that acts like kind of API credits in our system. And it also enables these normal centralized businesses to not have to deal with the currency risk of a typical cryptocurrency. So the CPU tokens can be equated to a certain number of API calls from a given API in the marketplace. And you'll safely know as a business user of that API that the price is gonna be the same today, tomorrow, a week later. Uh, and that enables these kind of transactions to happen in a much less volatile and more stable way that we think is gonna be really critical for real businesses to use these new uh, D services. Uh, I know this is a AI conference first and foremost, so I thought I should definitely give a shout out to our friends at the Deep Skies Lab who are doing this uh, really interesting work with uh, computer vision in deep space. You could help them with all this sexiness of these deep space images. These are the folks, uh, again, if you wanna Get in touch, Deep Skies Lab, doing really cool stuff. They're using data from these space telescopes, they're using computer vision, they're using cutting edge deep learning. Uh, and if you're in that world, please get in touch with them. It's super cool. It's, you know, great people and great to work with. If you are in the blockchain space, you could also help with all this sexiness that we do, which is our open rights exchange protocol and our API marketplace that we feel are really fundamental building blocks to getting lots of everyday consumers and business users to use these great blockchain startups and these new, great new blockchain technologies. We have an open source protocol. We'd love for your, your commits, your pull requests, your feedback, and we also have the API marketplace. And if you are a coder, we would love to host your APIs to help connect them uh, you know, across this, ba this barrier between the blockchain world and the centralized world. Um, that's my piece for today, uh, and happy to answer a couple questions. That's my contact details. If, if you want to help on any of this, if you want to talk about what we're doing, uh, please feel free to reach out. And I, I, I see at least one question over here, so maybe we'll start with you. Can you repeat the, yeah, that's a, a great question. So for those who couldn't hear, 
Uh, the question was, how do you provide a stable currency when there's changes in demand and, and market movement? Our strategy is an asset-backed coin. It's very specifically built for developers. So the asset we use to back our currency is cloud hosting time. And so basically, we have uh, contracted with hosting companies. So for developers who, for whatever reason, are tired of holding this currency, they can always exchange it for you know, minutes or hours or days of, of, of hosting. And so you know, we don't know that that's going to be you know, the, the stable currency that everyone wants. But for the people in our world of APIs and backend technology, we think that's going to be a really suitable thing for developers. Sorry for stealing this much of your microphone, but then who's going to pay for the for the cloud hosting time? You have the dollars oh, yes. in saving in uh, your bank account, and when they right. in the you know th this is a great question because I think people sometimes get too cute with a lot of leverage in the world of stable currencies. So our plan, and I think we've seen lots of over leverage leading to economic disaster in the last decade and no one wants that, right? And so what we're doing with our stable currency uh, is contracting uh, first for the hosting and we are not issuing any coins until we are paid. And so basically the users who want the stable currency, let's say I wanna uh, buy 10,000 API calls from Hadron to analyze images, right? they are going to charge me $1 for those 10,000 calls. That's an example. I, I don't know off the top of my head if that's their real pricing, so no one quote me on it, but let's say they're going to charge me a dollar for that. You send a dollar to us, we give you a dollar worth of stable coin, and you then make the calls. And so because we've taken the money up front, we, um, you know, we're not leveraging it. We're holding that in reserves until it's used, and then Hadron trade, uh, takes it back out of our system. Uh, or if someone else comes along and, and, and you know, buys it up from them, right? Uh, they may also use the CPU currency to buy the services they, they want to run their business. Uh, or they may turn it into hosting with, with us and, and our partners. One more. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah, no. Ha ha happy to meet outside. And, yeah, because I, I do believe that uh, asset-backed currency is – the most stable, as long as you're not doing, you know, shady things with the accounting or the assets you're backing with. Um, and I think the other good thing about our system is we only need the amount of currency that it's taking to operate the APIs that are being used in the system, right? Our business plan doesn't rely on replacing the U.S. dollars, the global reserve currency, right? It basically acts just like store credits from other API marketplaces that exist in the centralized internet or, you know, other systems uh, that have a kind of, you know, pay up front, get services later uh, kind of business model. Uh, yeah, and so the suggestion is we should use some cryptocurrency derivatives. This is a conversation that I would be happy to have, and I think we're open-minded, but I don't think we want to do that in the early days. Like, the value we're delivering to the market is bridging the gap between the blockchain companies and their potential customers, and vice versa, the companies that want to sell to blockchain companies. And so I want to do that in the least controversial way possible with the uh, you know, lowest risk, safest bets. Uh, but over the long run, it may turn out that there are financial instruments that help make that safer and even less risky. Uh, we'd be open to that, but I don't think we need to do that any time in the near future. The, the power we need to deliver is like a really strong protocol that makes it really easy for developers from these two worlds to work together. And I think that's the best thing for us and the best thing for the market. Bang on time. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.